before kind of setting context and opening this space, I just want to share something that happened to me yesterday that really connected me to this conversation that uh, is about to unfold. Uh, somebody who had been gone for a while came back to the community I'm living in and was asking me, what's going to happen next for you? What's, what's, what are your next steps? And uh, after really feeling that question, the answer that came is, what's happening now uh, are my next steps. Um, and in so many ways, like these things that are happening right now in my life are the same as the things that are happening next. The, the things I'm moving into are happening right now. Um, and with the four uh, speakers that are here to share about the work they're doing, I also have that same sense that the work they're doing now is really uh, what's coming next. They're really visionaries in that sense in really showing us what is possible. Uh, so I hope we can learn more about these different uh, leaders and visionaries and the spaces that they hold um, and use that to broaden our imaginations and to connect to the possibilities uh, of what's coming next or what's possible. Uh, so before uh, starting the conversation, I just want to set a little context and share a little bit about uh, each speaker in each space, just in case people are not familiar. Um, and then we'll move into that. So I'll just do a quick screen share, um, just introducing the spaces and uh, folks and context that uh, they're coming from. Um, so yeah, we'll start here. And this is, uh, so Joe Brewer will be one of the, the speakers that we'll be sharing. Uh, hello, Joe, welcome. And this is part of his project here, Barachara Regeneration Project. Um, and I won't go through all the details, but I just want to put it out there just so people know kind of more uh, where Joe is coming from. Um, and within this project um, is the Ecoversity Project, the uh, community learning space that he's starting um, along with many others. Um, so just to give you a sense of what that's looking like, um, yeah, I'll just scroll through the website and uh, Sierra, I can't see the chat, but if you could drop links to people are welcome to, you know, look more deeply into each of these projects uh, now or in their own time. Um, so Joe is, uh, yeah, doing his work in, in Barachar, Colombia and doing beautiful land regeneration work. Um, and next we have Angel, Dr. Angel Acosta. Um, and Angel is doing so much work, uh, just led a beautiful online conference um, around education and play and kind of deepening connection. Um, and yeah, just reading through this, I, I'm amazed at all the different projects that Angel's working on, um, including the contempt contemplating 400 years of inequality experience and um, leading the fellowship at the Garrison Institute um, and so many other projects and offerings. And, uh, and you can learn more about these and explore, uh, you know, a lot of his work is at the interface between uh, healing and inequality and contemplative action. Um, so I do, yeah, encourage you to check out more of Angel's work and he has a podcast and YouTube channel with, um, yeah, conversations and um, yeah, explorations with various other healers and uh, people working at these, uh, these intersections. Uh, and Lakshmi um, is, yeah, the visionary behind the Inner Climate Academy, uh, which is in Oroville, India, um, and the actions uh, throughout you know, India, Central India, and different parts of the country. Uh, and it's really, yeah, actions dedicated to research, collaboration, and transformation. Um, and I'll, I'll share a few about uh, the programs. You know, a lot of the work is with youth and women um, looking at climate resilience. And uh, she shared a little bit this morning about a fellowship that is sparking up um, with youth in the bio region that she's coming from. Um, so yeah, these are 
some of the areas that uh, the Inner Climate Academy and Lakshmi are exploring. Um, and Mayan is the yeah, visionary behind Kufund, Kufunda Village. Um, she shared the it's a community. Um, so a grassroots uh, learning space, you know, really centered in community and um, so many different offerings, uh, practical sustainability, art of hosting, uh, different games that have been created and women are medicine and so many beautiful projects happening there and uh, within uh, the community, within the village. Uh, they have the village, the school, and farming projects uh, located in Zimbabwe. Um, so again, uh, if you're you know feeling drawn to these spaces, I encourage you to look more deeply into them and and reach out to the speakers individually, sharing your interest, or if you're inspired, you know share that inspiration, or if you want to explore potential ways to link your projects with theirs. Um, yeah, connection and um, collaboration are also big values that we're holding here in this coming together. Um, so with that being said, uh, we're gonna spotlight the speakers here. I'll just set a little bit of context um, around what the flow will be for this conversation. Um, and uh, so Sierra, if you could please just spotlight um, the four speakers and myself. Um, we're going to start with a bit more structure um, and uh, have a fishbowl uh, model with Joe. Joe took part in the fishbowl at one of the previous online gatherings. So Joe is familiar with this, but uh, for others, I'll just share. Uh, I'm going to ask a question. Um, and within this structure, each person will have five minutes to answer the question. Um, so we're gonna try to really keep it uh, within the time frame. And at the four minute mark, I can do a little thing with my hands here to give you a, a heads up that we're at the four minute mark. And um, and then we'll kind of, you know, give each person uh, space to answer. And uh, if you do need to run over a little bit, if you're on a flow, that's okay. Um, but we're gonna hold it loosely, but also try to stick with that. Uh, and then as we transition through the call, we'll, we'll drop the structure a bit and move into more of a, a flowing space, um, bringing in voices as well from the participants. Uh, and Angel also I'll share is, is, you know, not feeling well, so he's gonna be dropping off a little bit early. Uh, he'll be with us for the first uh, 40 minutes or so. So yeah, special. Deep thank you, Angel, for still being with us, even though you're uh, a bit under the weather. Um, so without further ado, um, yeah, I'll, I'll share the first question and, and whoever feels called to start the sharing is welcome to unmute and just start. And um, you're all, all welcome just to kind of weave in through there. Um, so the first question is, uh, both broad and specific. Uh, the broad part is how is the work you're doing? Um, how are the spaces you're creating uh, healing or serving the planet as a whole, uh, serving cultural regeneration, uh, environmental regeneration? Uh, how is your work kind of regenerating the planet and cultures that we're a part of? Uh, and second, uh, more personal, maybe if you want to bring in a story uh, from your personal journey, uh, that would be beautiful. But how, how are the spaces you're creating uh, similar or different than the spaces you grew up in? You, maybe your you know, spaces of education or spaces of community or spaces of research, uh, however that might make sense to you. But yeah, how are these spaces that you're you know, bringing to life uh, different? Than the learning environments that you kind of grew up in. Um, and I will mute myself and move into the timer mode and deep listening mode. Yeah. Uh, so if I, if I whoever may, feels I'd called to, to share is welcome. I'd love to go first since I'm the, the one that has a little bit of a virulent uh, cold. Um, 
Hello, everybody. And I know that I, I have uh, time constraints, but I will slow down and uh, articulate uh, my thoughts and feelings. Um, I, uh, I felt uh, sick last week and I'm still kind of bouncing back. So, uh, but I didn't want to miss this. So I, um, I do think that fatigue and, and sickness are legitimate sites of knowledge production. Um, they, they can be, we don't always have to be all productive and efficient to, to make a claim around what it means to be human in this present moment. So I'm just excited to be here. I, um, I have a unique uh, orientation around healing work. Um, I, I had a difficult task of working in a university system and uh, having to defend the idea that we should focus on healing as a serious principle for pedagogical, theoretical, and policy focus. Yeah. I was at a research one university at Columbia, spent five years there. And you could imagine people ask me, what are you, what are you doing? What are you researching? <laughs> and I'd say, I'm, here, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at healing-centered education. For years, it was like, what are you talking about? But I, I wasn't deterred. And I my role was to look in the field and examine what were healing-centered pedagogies, healing-centered pedagogies. And the reality is that the, uh, as a human community, we've had all kinds of rituals, practices, ceremonies, all kinds of doings to enable us to engage in and confront suffering, confront adaptations to different terrains, psychological, environmental, ecological, spiritual. And so the evidence is there. Um, question is, how do you make an argument for it in the modern neoliberal academy? So I slowed down and I looked at the evidence and the evidence is clear. One of the first, not first, one of the clearest sites for healing centered pedagogies was in indigenous people's responses to colonial and imperial rule. So the practices deployed by indigenous people to preserve their psychic, soul, and emotional well-being, evidence, so clear, so clear. Yeah, enduring reservations, enduring famines, enduring extermination, and many of them are still here. Can you get any more healing-centered than that? So, and then, I, and then I went a little deeper and I began to make the argument that actually, oh, there's more, there's a couple other paradigms that might be a little bit more friendly to the academy. So for example, mindfulness, the explosion of mindfulness in, in, in the world, specifically in the United States over the last 50 years, um, deeply influenced by American Buddhism and Buddhist and, and the resonance, of the Buddhist Eightfold Path. Uh, mindfulness being an example of healing-centered education. You know, the recent obsession with trauma, uh, very, very important. We need to know about trauma and its impact. And, uh, but to the move around trauma-informed care and trauma-informed teaching and trauma-sensitive teaching, and the body keeps the score. Yes, yes, thank you. So trauma-informed teaching as another strand. Uh, restorative justice, finding different ways to approach punitive approaches, the behavior in the classroom, but also outside of classrooms, like our obsession with prisons, especially in the United States. The social emotional learning, social emotional learning. And so just take that, restorative, restorative justice, mindfulness, uh, social emotional learning, and indigenous attempts to respond to colonial rule, all are evidence of the healing centered turn in education. That's my work. That's where I operate. And um, the last thing I'll say is that I carried my research as a ceremony, not as a normal study. That's how, that's my story in terms of how I disrupted that. And we just teach courses online on healing centered education as much as we can. Thank you.
we're all being so polite. And gosh, Angel, that just, it sinks. It really sinks. I was going to ask, Lakshmi, were you about to go or should I go? What do you prefer? Okay. Um, what I want to share is from my deep tunnel into ecological grief, um, partially informed by being trained as an earth system scientist. Like if you want to really get depressed about climate change, study climate as a scientist, look up close at the death of ecosystems and you know, it's, it's pretty intense. And this was for me 20 years ago. Uh, and then trying to find my way into a place where in 2016, I chose to have a child and bring a child into the world, knowing how dangerous the world is for humanity in the next few decades. And so I wanna begin by saying that the work that we're doing in Barichara, Colombia is very, very special for a few reasons most of which have to do with this landscape and what the indigenous lifeways of this landscape can tell us. And I am not from this landscape. So there's something about re returning to indigeneity since every human alive is the descendant of indigenous people. And so there's something about returning to indigeneity that's a key theme for us with um, what we're doing in Barichara. And for me, it's very personal connected to my daughter who is almost six years old. And the, the profound need I felt within myself to bring dead rivers back to life with children. So that all the children growing up today just learn that a dead river can be brought back to life because they will have done it during their childhood. And so um, I wanna begin by naming Bari Chara, which is the name of the village where I live in the Northern Andes of Colombia. Its name is from the indigenous language of the Guane people, who officially uh, were wiped out by the genocide. There's still remnants of their culture and their people, but the genocide was, was unfortunately rather successful. Um, but Barichara translates into English as the place of rest. Or if you were to say in Spanish, el lugar donde puede descansar. And this is a place of deep healing because of the ability to connect into the slowness of geology in a place that is dominated by three mountain ranges, three major rivers and a series of canyons and a multi thousand year old trade network between three federated networks of indigenous peoples, the Tirona to the North, the Muisca to the South and the people who most recently were called Guani here in these canyons because there's at least 7,000 years of archeological evidence of people in this region and in areas nearby going back 13 to 14,000 years. So at least that long, there have been humans in these places. And when I learned about ecoversities, which I learned about them from Manish Jain back in 2015 or 2016, when the Ecoversity Alliance was just getting started, it immediately resonated this idea that we need to unlearn and decolonize education and put it into a place-based context of ecology and culture. I grew up in the Ozarks in Missouri in North America and the United States never resonating with where I was from, but loving the land. And so um, to find a home on another continent in a time of planetary crisis where humans may well go extinct, that gets a real possibility with what is happening this return to indigeneity is a, is a really difficult and for people in our generation, it's not going to end. It's not like I've become indigenous. It's, there's a journey of multiple generations to return to these roots for most of us who weren't born into them. You know, my indigenous people were probably wiped out 2000 years ago, somewhere in the Mediterranean and Southern Europe. And so I, I have a long way to recover my own indigenous roots historically, but my body is, is a human body and I can relate to land. And what I wanna share about what's happening in Barichara is that we're engaging in large scale landscape restoration, 500,000 hectares. It's the size of the regional climate system and the network of rivers. And this can be defined in part by the unique ecology. There's a very special ecosystem here called the High Andes Tropical Dry Forest. There are many tropical dry forests on earth, but this is the only one that combines cloud forest of the high Andes 
together with desert plants of the canyons and what are more typical of dry forests and other tropical regions around the world. Eight out of 10 species are endemic and 95% of the forest was cut down. So this is a place where ecological genocide of a sort has also occurred. And what I feel really powerfully about this place, and Angel, I'm so glad to follow what you've said in this, the pedagogy of healing is that the place of rest in Barichara is a place for creating a different model of regenerative education where we can connect back to the deep humanity of being part of a landscape while also working to restore soils and to restore biodiversity and create a local economic patterning of relationships that can be in harmony with landscapes. But I wanna just hold the, the awareness that the collective trauma healing and what was said in the, I think it was the Kundra Village website where you had the, the focus on um, women as medicine. We have an aggregation and accumulation of women as medicine healers in this place. And we just had an event a week and a half ago where the women tended the fire and held people from the crypto and web three and decentralized finance and decentralized governance worlds who are trying to help regeneration. And they were held in the container of shamanic women. And it actually enabled people who spend almost all their time on computers to connect to land in a way they didn't know was possible. So there's something really profound about these healing pedagogies. Um, and so uh, with that, I will pass it forward to whomever would like to go next. I can hear <laughs> Mayanne here. I hope you can hear me. I'm on a satellite internet connection from Zimbabwe, so it's not always um, very good. Um, really good to be here. <clears throat> <sighs> yeah. So what can I share? So I'm from Kufunda. Kufunda means learning in Shona, the one of the local languages of Zimbabwe. So we're a learning village. And we're almost 21 years old, so we're, we'll, we'll come off age next year. Um, and we are a learning village in Zimbabwe, learning our way into what it takes to create healthy, vibrant community. And so that's been our question since the beginning. So I have a Zimbabwean mother and a Danish father, well, they're ancestors now, but um, that's my, my origin. And... What I saw growing up um, in Denmark was that what we value, I, I, I think I can generalize and say as a world, was much more towards the North than towards my experience of the South. And yet what really nourished me and what rooted me and what inspired me was what I found in my uh, Shona Zimbabwean family and especially my rural family. And so I returned to Zimbabwe, yeah, 20 odd years ago with this question of, and I saw people look to me and be like, oh, you're so lucky, you're studying in Denmark, you're, and I was like, and I, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to deny their challenges, but also I felt like they were not seeing what, what, maybe, maybe as an outsider coming back in, I saw such value and such wisdom and such power and such richness. Um, and I saw so much fraying and loneliness and dissolution in my northern experience. Um, so I, I came back as a facilitator. I was like, I don't know anything about creating healthy, vibrant community. <laughs> Who am I? But I, I know that you know, and I trust myself to be part of hosting that um, answer through lived experience. And so we've been at it for 20 years. And um, gosh, the Kofunda story is, is, is long, um, but I think what we are contributing now, I think that was one of the questions, in what way are we serving the planet? And I think I'm loving to hear these different stories and each place, so place is everything in some ways, and each place where people remember who they are and connect really deeply, both physically and, and, uh, and practically with the land, 
and the animals, but also spiritually. And, and, and my sense has been, and especially in the more recent years, something in us has matured so that we've been able to open to the land much more fully. So in the past, we used to say healing the land, we're healing the land. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we're healing with the land and the land is our teacher and we can serve the land and we can learn together. Um, and that's just been such a shift. And so, so yes, we work with, so we work with everything because what does it take to create healthy, vibrant community is everything. So it's the children and the women and the soil and the animals and the, what am I missing? And the eco building and the, you know, what, whatever, the herbs and the, and the, and the ancestors. Yeah, the ancestors have also come in strong in the last few years. So I feel like Kufunda and Zimbabwe is a, a I've never, I've never actually thought it like this before, but I actually feel like we're a wisdom school and it's not that we have the wisdom, but it's that we are on a wisdom journey and that um, by opening with humility, it just comes, <laughs> it just comes. And sometimes it comes through, I think that's my time, encounters, sometimes it comes through experience. I don't know, it just comes. I want to say one more thing. And, and that is that, um, no, it's fine. It'll come in the next round. Wonderful to be here. And, uh, and, and I'm just, I just left a group of biodynamic farmers from all over Africa who are gathering here for five days. Um, and so we've just been in big conversation around what it takes to listen to the, to the unique individuality. I hesitate to use that word here, but the unique individuality of each place. Um, and so we'll be on a we'll be on a listening journey tomorrow uh, as farmers, but also as stewards of land together. Yeah, c'est moi. And now I think it's your turn, Lakshmi. <laughs> yeah, I have to speak now. Thank you, Mayan, uh, and thank you all. Um, it's just such an honor to be here, listening to your stories, and to share mine. Um, so. My journey began when I was very little. I, I enjoyed playing, um, climbing trees, running around, eating fruits and getting lost in um, rural, small town, India, in Kerala. Um, and really, I think I always talk about that experience because I think something of that has stayed with me, um, of being free, um, of just enjoying what's around and being sustained and nourished by it. Um, and that took me to a, a whole journey of activism when I learned about what's happening around me at a very young age and then into research, into project management of big um, environment projects. Um, I studied environment. So this has been, a, um, I'm 38. So this has been a big part of my uh, life and um, and I think the one point where it really ran deep within me where I think all of me started engaging with this uh, was when I fell sick and really really sick there is something about um, that vulnerability that comes with um, you know knowing that um, that I'm not longer able to um, just take it for granted. Uh, and that uh, my health and the way that my body is behaving is related to so many things around me. Um, and it is not independent from the systems and the collapse of the world as we know it. And, and I'm feeling it in my body. That led me also to the stories of my ancestors, especially women. Uh, and sitting with that, their journey, their pain, uh, their connection to nature and what was taken from them and, and also what, what they have done and the guilt that I also have inherited. Um, so it's a mixed bag <laughs> uh, that led to a complete breakdown. Um, yeah, in 2012, I think. Uh, and, and, and that was the, the beginning of my healing journey and also stepping into um, realization about um, that my healing is not independent from the healing of the world. 
Um, and, uh, you know, my pain is not disconnected from the pain of the world. That what I feel in my body and my soul is the pain that we all go through. And I have it in my own way. Uh, so that's a snippet, like a little thing from my um, very specific journey that I've been on. So I lived in Australia for a, a good part of a decade. Um, and then uh, with all of this and my, um, my ever increasing relationship with my ancestors and ancestor beings and gods and god beings and animals that they were connected to, I very quickly found my way back to India because I wanted to be on this land, um, South India specifically. And, um, and I moved to Oroville very soon after I moved back to India. Um, and it was for very um, practical re reasons. I wanted to be surrounded by trees. I wanted to walk barefoot. I wanted to be safe as a woman. Um, I wanted a place to heal. Uh, you know, and I had a list where I had written down these very practical things um, down. And, um, and somehow I ended up here. I came for a month. I'm here eight years later. So um, uh, there you go. Um, and just quickly about Inner Climate Academy. Um, just from my experience of the uh, of the climate world, if you were to call it with climate solutions and uh, climate adaptation strategies and all of that, I, I really feel that um, we are sort of um, moving ahead without reflection. So there's this urgency to create solutions but we really don't know <laughs> what solutions, you know? So we're just running and, and when the, because there's a crisis, we are running faster without really knowing why we are running faster. And we are creating uh, problems over problems and complexity over complexity. So one solution becomes a problem later. Um, and, and it just goes on, you know, it's just kind of fumbling in the dark and being really anxious. And, um, and so in a climate Academy um, is really a space to slow down, uh, to really take a step back and go within. Um, and the focus is the climate and the ecological emergency, but really when you go within, I don't think there are boundaries. <laughs> everything is connected to everything else. So um, how do we, uh, you know, what are the questions we are asking and can we, uh, are, they, are they the right questions um, uh, to ask? And how do we, um, you know, how do we not, already know the answer. So how do we sit with the discomfort of having a question that doesn't have an answer yet? And perhaps I may not be individually coming up with that answer. Perhaps it's a collective answer that needs to emerge and I might have a small piece of it. So how do you sit with that? So this are, these are the sort of questions that, um, you know, uh, we um, facilitate, uh, our facilitated programs um, grapple with. And I'll talk more about it later. So because I think my time's up. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you. What a beautiful segue into the next question. <laughs> you know, how do we grapple with a question that we don't have an answer to? Um, well, yeah, and it, I guess in the spirit of emergence with, within the structure, um, I, I want to invite each of you to continue on any themes or threads that feel alive um, and take the question I share as an invitation, but if you feel drawn into, you know, pulling on threads that are already present, uh, feel more than free to just go in that direction and not even respond to this question. But the question is also broad and can be connected to many threads. So also maybe it can be weaved in. Um, and the question is, uh, what are some transformative learning uh, experiences that you've witnessed in your spaces? You know, those moments where it's like, you know, there's moments of doubt, like, is this working? Is this what I'm doing? You know, is, it, is this the right thing to be doing? But then there's those moments where it just clicks and it's like, oh, shoot, like, yes, it's working. And you feel it in your body and you, you hear it, you see it in the people and the, uh, the land around you. So I guess what are those, you know, transformative learning experiences that you've witnessed that, you know, really clicked it for you? Like, yes, this is it. Like, this is where I need to be putting my energy. This is my purpose. This is my 
offering uh, to the world. Um, and again, uh, hold that as you wish uh, within all the other emerging threads that uh, are coming to life. Uh, there is a thread between pretty much all of us um, in terms of the return, you know, and you know, thinking about indigeneity in Joe's context, right? Thinking about uh, returning to to land in both Lakshmi and Mayan's context, um, there is for me is when I've seen people return. Um, and, and then in this case, during the pandemic with this moment of Zoom and digital learning, it's interesting to kind of grasp, like what, is, what, is, what do you mean by return when there's no real land base? But I, I've seen uh, people through these dynamic learning experiences whereby Zoom becomes a transformative vehicle for genuine connection and affirmation that people have been able, in some cases, to arrive at a genuine sense of who they are as learners in this moment, in this moment, by way of those breakout groups, by way of the stimulating conversations that can come from some of these panels. So I'm, I'm just kind of struck with this conversation here as I'm, as I'm kind of arriving myself and returning. And then also just this last two years of online learning that many of us have engaged in. I swear to you, we all deserve doctorates. If you think about all the time you've spent on Zoom and on, on whatever other digital platform you've engaged in, in whatever community, it, it's, it's enough to, to, to give your whole family uh, a terminal degree. Um, so I'll just, the last thing I'll say is that the, the forces, the structural forces like white supremacy, like racialized capitalism, those strong forces are so are so strong in terms of how they shape our perception of ourselves as learners. You know, we're supposed to be learning a specific way. We're supposed to be productive. We're supposed that any 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 time I've seen an experience where people can relax into their own sense making, it opens up opportunities to connect to land to in, in an odd way i've become more integrated in terms of the immediate land that i'm in by some of the digital relationships that i've nurtured so just wanted to kind of um share that that this 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 metaphor of return and then oftentimes the paradox that that return might not necessarily be to a particular land base but a return to self um maybe including inner child work and just kind of getting comfortable with just how we make sense of, of the word and how we learn in a, in, a, in, a, in a unique and genuine way. Yeah, may I build on that, if that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that's been really strong in my life in the last three years, as I started writing a book and gave away the chapters with an online study group instead of publishing it, but then members of the study group published it. And um, this became a group called Earth Regenerators, which now has 4,200 members and has transformed the lives of at least several hundred people in both the ways that Angel was just describing, this way of, <laughs> you know, we hold the lack of belonging together in a Zoom room, and that gives us a way of returning to ourselves. And then some of them have actually found their way to the land as well. And it's been very interesting to see to, to witness both of those processes. And one thing I use uh, as a semantic filter for my work is I talk very openly about planetary collapse as a way of filtering away everyone who is not far enough in the grieving process to be ready for transformational change. And just within the lens of what's happening at the planetary scale and how to become part of cultural regeneration uh, patterns. And that, that filter of basically turning, being most people being turned off. Uh, the majority of people, 99% of people look at the first chap, first sentence of my book and be like, no, he's talking about possible human extinction. I'm not interested in that. And then those who step beyond that 
to say, wow, someone who finally accepts the world's really fucked. And you know, things are really bad. And it's scary and dangerous. And I'm tired of feeling that alone. You know, I don't want to feel that alone anymore. Lakshmi, I'm sure you get a lot of this with the work you're doing. Um, that once we enter into the safe space of just being authentic about how scared we are, the safe space of how worried we are, um, the transformations are, I mean, I'll say like they're instant in a, in a sense that they flow naturally from the ability to feel safe being honest, the ability to let our guard down. And so I just want to name that piece to put into the flow that paradoxically the digital learning has opened up a way for people to connect to their bodies and to the land. And so much of it is being able to be honest and vulnerable in the presence of others, which enough people feel better doing that digitally with someone that they feel a worldview affinity with. Like, I don't believe in those, you know, bogus greenwashing climate solutions. I want something real. And that's a place of authentic connection um, or whatever other ones there may be. So I wanted to add that into the conversation. I can go up. I've, I've had a, a different experience. I have spent a fair amount of time in Zoom, but probably not as much as most most people here. Um, Kufunda, uh, <clears throat> when my parents moved back to Zimbabwe from Denmark, they bought this land, <clears throat> which was, we were surrounded by white farmers. And so when we started our work, we had to go out <laughs> into Zimbabwe to find the rural farmers that we wanted to work with. And, um, and then, as you may know, Zimbabwe had land redistribution and the white farmers got kicked off their land and the land got portioned into small pieces and, and new farmers came in, but they were quite commercially, they were like in, I've got my little piece of land, I'm going to get on with it. And so our community building invitations, they were not interested. Um, and then the last few years, we, you know, some have started coming like, what, like, we want to know what you're doing. But, but most of our work was actually, yeah, we would travel out into Zimbabwe, so to speak. And so the gift of Corona for us was everything was, you know, and um, and now we were surrounded, so surrounded by black farmers who had now had about 10 years on the land, struggled, <laughs> tried the fertilizers and pesticides. And um, and so we've had the most extraordinary two years of lockdown because, you know, we're 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 all here. And so community building in, in another way that has just been hyper local. I don't know that's the right term. Um, and so the work that we've been doing in Zimbabwe to now have it happen every day at Kofunda. So the, the, the children, the, 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 our, our school, our primary school has been going for, for more years, but so that the children could continue mostly under the radar. <laughs> Don't tell anyone, but keep coming to school. <laughs> we got closed down a few months, but, but mostly continue. And, um, and the women on medicine work, and rather than having women from all over Zimbabwe, come, come rural women, come local women. Um, and and I think what Kufunda has held on to is a dream and a vision. And I, gosh, I, I I hear you, Joe. And and I think each human being is different. And so I, I'm I'm not at all focused on the fact that we're in the middle of collapse. At one level, I know it. And right now, right here, I have to focus on what's possible. What can we do? Um, and so what I'm seeing growing here is a sense of possibility. I mean, really, really financially poor. Um, marginalized people stepping in, planting trees, beginning to grow their organic and biodynamic vegetables, um, coming together in women's circles. The women are gathering. Oh, maybe we also need to get as, as, as the men coming together in men's circles, um, learning how to just, just learning, actually, like learning, doing, creating. And so one of our slogans is living the future today living the future today, what is the future that I long for and how can I birth it right right now? Um, yeah, and my question then is, because I don't feel disconnected from the world, but I feel like we've been going really in and now it's like, okay, now how do we, how do we link and connect out with all you guys? <laughs> 
So that's my, and and we do live in a we do live really with rural communities that for whom Zoom is not so natural. But yes, I, I have a sense of it's really time to weave, really time to weave. So that's me. You seem to be going in a certain pattern here <laughs> in terms of who speaks when. Um, yeah, thank you. I, um, I I resonate with what Angel and uh, Joe um, mentioned in terms of Zoom and the possibilities of um, real transformative experience. Um, if you had told me four years ago that I would be facilitating on Zoom, I would have laughed. Uh, I wouldn't have thought that was possible, but um, it really surprised me. About, it, it's not the same experience, but it is a significant experience nevertheless. Um, and it allows for connection. Uh, what instances that really surprised me during the lockdown when, um, when I had groups together were people um, sharing about how, you know, I had come in with this pain in my body and it's gone now. And that was, that had nothing to do with what we spoke about, <laughs> you know, uh, that, and, and things like that where somehow the body was involved and the body was speaking, even if it is such a disembodied sort of screen, um, um, interaction. Um, uh, that's one. But uh, for me, actually, right now, um, where I am feeling the magic of transformation is the weaving that you were talking about, um, Mayan. I, I have this feeling that something's in the air. I don't know if you feel that. Uh, just really, I, um, that Every uh, every second conversation, third conversation, I have someone speaking similar things in their own as their own truth in their own words, uh, and I, I and and because of the journeys that they have been on, you know, uh, and and it's so it's so aligned, and I just feel this this tingling of something is it's going on, um, and so I am, and so that's that's what what is really um, inspiring me right now. This this feeling of um, mushroom sprouting, you know, uh, coming out. And there is a mycelial network where there is this understanding, this um, realizations and insights that we as a species are having at different parts of the world. And it's sort of going underground and traveling and weaving and coming out in different humans in different forms. And Ecoversities for me is also that. Um, where we find, oh, you've sprouted, and you've sprouted, and 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 it's and it's uh, you know, and and uh, they're all diverse, beautiful, colorful expressions on their of their own, you know, um, and and that's and I think that's the that's I just today at, um, at another event I was talk, speaking about how you know we talk about this new world that we don't know what it looks like, how it feels like, but we know like, oh, here it feels like this, the texture, I can, I can touch the texture of it. And it feels like this, and oh, I, this sound, um, this, this might, you know, and that's, and, and you might have a little piece and I might have a piece and this, this picture that we are creating, co-creating, co-designing, uh, this emergent, um, world um and there's also so much curiosity about it um because we don't know and uh there might be pieces that uh, everyone's holding so for me that that there is the transformation um you know that is happening and and the more we uh the more i see people stepping into that into that kind of possibility um where there is an acceptance of possible collapse and and there's an acceptance of um you know a possible human extinction but there is still faith in the human experience of how beautiful that it can be and that not you know i really um and this is a very late realization for me because uh, there was an instance where i realized that oh actually I love humans. 
and uh, and there's such faith that human experience can be something different and it doesn't matter if we are extinct it doesn't matter you know if the systems collapse but this experience of ourselves as a species on this planet can be beautiful and flowing and we can go into the future dancing and singing together as a, as a vibrant community so um so that uh, I don't know if I've answered your question directly, but that's that's what's alive for me right now. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank each of you. Um, yeah, I think you've each answered the question perfectly in in whatever way uh, happened. Um, yeah, now I want to give space, Angel. I know. Um, yeah, you're not feeling well. If now is the time to drop off. Might be a good time. Thank you so much for being with hey, us. Everybody, I'm gonna go rest. Okay. Hope Thank you get you better Angela. soon. Yeah. Yes. Rest well. Thank you. And uh, from here, we're gonna shift into a a bit less structure. And um, instead of me asking questions, I'm gonna invite Lakshmi, Joe, and Mayan to ask each other questions. If you have any questions for each other. Um, and we'll be in this flow for about 15 or 20 minutes. Then after this, we'll shift to breakout rooms where Joe and Lakshmi and Mayan are both in separate or all in separate breakout rooms. And then folks on the call will have the choice to go to the different rooms, maybe somebody from the same region or somebody that you know really spoke to them that they want to ask more direct questions to. Um, so that'll be the flow for the rest of the session more or less, and then we'll come back as a whole group and, and kind of have some final words. But um, yeah, for this next chunk, uh, invite Joe, Mayan and Lakshmi to, yeah, ask each other questions if any questions have come up uh, for you uh, in the beginning uh, of this conversation. I actually have a question for you, Mayan, um, because I'm very interested in, how the uniqueness of place can create the learning exchanges between territories, between bioregions, between ecoversities. Um, and so when I look at what you've been doing, I just feel like, wow, there's so many people who could really learn from Kufunda, as you said, from the wisdom practice and exploration that is happening there. And it would feel very different in some ways and very similar in some ways to what's happening here in Barachara, Colombia. Like I saw these parallels, the medicine women of this place holding, you know, like the biodynamic farming and here we're doing centropic agriculture, but squint your eyes, it's very similar, you know? And, and there's something about um, what would be, you know, like, I guess it's maybe my question would be this way. What would you feel is beautiful to offer to, those from the outside world who would want to learn from your, your land and your place. What would that feel like for you if we were to explore these inter-bioregional exchanges? So Lakshmi, I'd love to hear from you as well, but I was just really drawn to that from my end, how you've been so inward focused in that. Like, what does that evoke in you? Oh, excellent, thank you. We want to learn some tropics, so maybe there's a, maybe there's some maybe there's already some exchange <laughs> at least that way. Um, the, the 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 one thing that comes to mind, and it doesn't come from Kufunda, it actually comes from a marriage of um, of work between Brazil and the Netherlands. But we've taken it on, and and it's and I feel like it's it's. It's so resonant with who we are. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and answer that, even though it's not directly out of our own um, soil, so to speak. Uh, so it's this game. I, I, if you saw it on the website, called Go Deep, and it and 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 the essence of it, which is the essence of our work, um, really is to support communities. So to enter and be alongside a community and to support a community in um, seeing itself with fresh eyes, you could say, with fresh eyes, with the heart, with appreciation. And, and, and we've, I mean, we, we work, we, we still work with communities across Zimbabwe and, and we, we do have a lot of um, unlearning from a colonial legacy 
of people thinking that they're less than. And so to enter in and really come with love and simple, playful practices that have them go out. It's not intellectual. We're not sitting somewhere and having big conversations. It's going out. It's seeing with fresh eyes. It's looking for the beauty. It's it's going to talk to the old lady on the corner of this of the of the dusty road or whatever. It's finding the young people. It's and 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 through a very simple, very playful process of of several days, um beginning to it's like attention how how is it where we place our energy there there our there we bring life. So that attention, bringing life to community. And so I, it's actually linked to the question that you'd asked, Dan, that I didn't answer is what I've seen so many times is coming in with the, I almost feel like it's the sun of light and love and placing it and, and, and inviting the community to see again. And, you know, you come in and there's conflict and you got to help us resolve this. And, and, and it, and we don't even it's just like and then and then the and then the dreaming and the pride and the possibility and the capacity and and the beauty of the go deep game is it doesn't only look at the at the good and the and the positive because sometimes then later the shit rises again but it uses that strength to then look at what are the issues we need to deal with how how are we actually with power how are we actually with equality? How are we with um, working with process work to, to bring those dynamics in? So I, I feel like not only Kofuna, but around the world, there's so much learning around um, really potent, transformative community processes. And for me, individuals, I love the, the name, the inner climate justice, inner climate change. Um, but the, the, so the inner, the, the inner, Academy, thank you. Sorry. How the inner, I have to transform here, but I can't do it alone. And we have to transform here. And, and then I actually do think so much becomes possible um, in terms of syntropic farming, in terms of regeneration, in terms of, but it, but it is, yeah, it is a human journey. And so to share our lessons, but also to learn from you. So I'm also curious, like, what are you learning about people? remembering and then stepping forward in new and um, regenerative ways what's yeah what are you seeing what are you experiencing um such a beautiful question uh one thing that's special about where i am is that 40 years ago where i live now was the most violent place in colombia and now it's this island of peace and people say, why is Barichara so peaceful and prosperous? And, and it turns out there's a, a, a man and a woman who live here. The man is from Barichara. He was born and raised here. His wife is from Villa de Leva, which is close to Bogota. And the two of them teach theater and documentary filmmaking to children. And then the children become the storytellers of the community. And a few years ago, they were asking the children to explore issues of water. So water's a serious issue here, a lot of concern about water. And the children said, yo, where did the water go? Oh, well, the water went away when everyone was killing each other, when there was this violence. And I said, yes, but it's peaceful now. Where did the peace come from? Well, go ask your grandfather and your grandmother because they created the peace. And then they made this documentary called La Paz Anonima, The Anonymous Peace, because all of the old men and women who created the peace are still alive. There was this period of 30 or 40 years where the, this, the nation of Colombia was invisible, like it wasn't even here. Local people killing each other for decades and there were no police, there were no interventions, there was no protection. And then the local people decided no more of that and they created their own peace process. And then they created the most stable, peaceful and prosperous place in Colombia. And so the, you know, the paradox in that is that the, the place that is, that's really, Bani Chara is not like the rest of Colombia because it's the peaceful place. Whereas in the 1970s, it was the most violent place in Colombia. And, and so there's something so special about people coming here and learning this big surprise. The big surprise is that because this was the most violent place, the local people took it upon themselves to fix it. And yeah, and I definitely recommend watching that documentary. It's pretty incredible. It's in Spanish, but it has English subtitles. And 
And so what I feel is like, it's this way of thinking people around the world say Colombia is a violent place, but Colombia is one of the most innovative places for peace because it was such a violent place in the last century. And these paradoxes are so important for us. Um, so centropic agriculture here is, we practice centropic agriculture so we can practice centropic human culture. How do we create the context for maximizing synergy and symbiosis between humans in the way that centropic systems maximize the synergistic relationships between plants? You basically design the, you know, you design the selection of plants so that they arrive into their appropriate place in ecological succession without competing with another plant. You know, this plant arrives into stage one of ecological succession as the emergent species, the tall one. This is the ground cover. This is the one that puts nitrogen in the soil. Each of them has its appropriate place, which is in time, space, and function of the ecosystem. And that's what centropic agriculture is about, is creating these, these symbiotic relationships and minimizing competition between the plants and where they arrive into the ecosystem. So you can see how that maps directly to human economics. We want to create the most symbiotic human relationships that minimize competition by creating functional places that each can have of their own. And so we have this relationship between trauma healing circles led by women, which is, I think, very similar to what you described. It's probably very similar to what you've been doing. Uh, women creating these spaces of, uh, they call them circles de palabras, you know, circles of, of talking to heal trauma which immediately translates into supply chains in the local food system of local families creating food sovereignty. They, they, they very quickly go there because so much of their tra trauma is, is connected to the inability to have healthy subsistence living. So to connect that to centropic agriculture as a way of managing their land and creating food resilience is like we're creating local food systems and changing supply chains all in the same process. And so I think um, I think the way that the, the people here are doing that would to create a, a cultural exchange of learning with with Kufrinda would be phenomenal. Um, to learn from you and to have you learn from the people here would just be incredible. Um, so I've rambled a bit, perhaps, but so much to say. <laughs> well, I have a question for the both of you, um, and this is around resilience. So we've been looking at um, emotional resilience and emotional community emotional resilience, so not on an individual level, but as a collective. How do we build strength of a community so that they are emotionally resilient uh, collectively? Um, with a focus on climate events um, that might be coming up or climate adaptation and coming up with climate adaptation strategies as communities. Um, and what so we've been doing a bit of research theoretical framework just look at what has been studied so far what is um and so before we began the research we you know we had written down what we thought might be important um which was um you know cultural memory of landscapes cultural you know eco heritage um songs and stories uh connection to land um ancestors so uh, and it was it was really interesting that the research is coming up, you know, th there are theories of community resilience out there that points to these points. Um, but I, I just and so now we are at the at the kind of juncture where we are trying to design uh, a youth fellowship that looks at eco heritage as a way to build climate resilience. Um, because in the climate resilience world, it's often usually um, disaster response. You know, but what is that work that needs to be done before, uh, so that a community builds up its strength? It's uh, not just uh, not just strength as in emotional strength, but also traditional ecological knowledge, and to uh, really see um, for themselves that they have the knowledge within them to be able to uh, sustain their and and maybe look at where do they need support. Um, and so we, we're kind of grappling with this, and I would like the both of you from your experience with community work to respond to this. And, and from where I see it, I think this work needs that cultural exchange. 
you know, here's what we're doing here in this place, uh, and here's what they are doing. And there might be um, learnings that could be um, interesting for both. It may work or may not work, but I think that <laughs> there, there has to be that kind of a network of exchange of this is what different communities around the world are doing with respect to emotional community resilience. So. Mm -hmm. My I'll just sneak in real quick. And oh, just, yeah, yeah. Say maybe this will be the last uh, question and answers for this section, just because I want to honor the time and also enable folks to get some time with each of you to ask questions. So maybe about six or eight more minutes uh, in this section of the call. Mm. My end, you I'm not sure I can. You've got the question. So if you if you if you're ready to to kick off, Joe, then then I'll that would be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think this question about um, climate resilience understood holistically as you know, regional or territorial scale systems resilience, um, the cultural memory and the reconstruction of cultural memory is extremely important, especially as it relates to native plants and the use of them to make textiles, to make construction materials, to make medicine, to make food. There's so much in the reconstruction of ecological knowledge as it relates to plants, as it connects to that, that history and land that I think is very, very important. And also um, something that has been really powerful in our work with the online community of Earth Regenerators, and also we see it within Barichara, is a framework called ProSocial. And I recommend anyone who's interested to go to pro-social world to learn more about this, this blending of knowledge about how to manage the commons together with studies in contextual behavioral science about how human beings can basically be in relationship with themselves and with, with each other, together with the, all of the research on the evolution of cooperation in living systems. And they blend these bodies of knowledge. And one of the foundational pieces of a pro-social group as the individual members of the group cultivate the capacity to regulate their emotions and to be psychologically flexible. Now, with this are many other elements, but just to name how all of our all of our trauma coping mechanisms, when they come up, are about not having emotion regulation or not having psychological flexibility in some way. And so there's something about like within contextual behavioral science, there's a framework called the ACT matrix, which is called acceptance and commitment therapy. Sometimes they call it acceptance and commitment training, but the ACT matrix starts with um, noticing and accepting how we're feeling in a moment that enables us to take action without judgment. And all mindfulness practices are connected to this. So this is very obvious to people who do mindfulness practice, but that space between noticing and accepting before judgment comes in, that place is where all psychological resilience is cultivated. And so to, to bring that into being through ceremony and community process, to bring it in through storytelling and theater, to bring it in through movement like dance and martial arts and other expressions of body-based practice, and of course, through um, ecological history and the memory of place. So I think all of these together, focusing in on how do we go from noticing to accepting where we can bring in our mindful intentions to something that the ACT matrix really helps with. Um, and it, it explains how mindfulness practices work in, in a sort of Western scientific way or in a therapeutic way. But the clarity of that is very helpful because it really validates and venerates all of the traditional practices that do this. And then there's so much more to say, but. <laughs> I'm happy to leave it at that because I, I want to give me a, another, just a sentence because I feel like I could say stuff, but I, because I didn't, I feel like I didn't fully grasp the question. I, I would probably just be rambling. Um. Would love to hear from you, man, but maybe we can take it outside of this discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, well, it's so beautiful to hear the that question. Yeah, without having fully grasped the question, I, I think what I'm I'm with as I listened 
it has to do with um for some reason what's coming up is colonial legacy healing and about um and about reaching um and um and so again a, a, a deep listening and honoring and not to go back to the past because we can't but that we we re, we really reroute into and then we then find our way forward so so that what's coming to me and i i'm remembering um yeah different organizations that have done that specifically around about uh, around and and uh and out of that visions for the future being born, because some people say, wow, it's not that long ago we had the, the flowing rivers and the, and the, um, but I, but I feel like it's, it's more than land. It, it feels like it's also a cultural reclamation. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to say, I wish we had a lot more time to be in conversation. And I realize that there is a cafe coming up, but because I'm in the middle of a, of a gathering in person here. I'm, I, when I leave here, I'm, I'm not going to come back in to the Zoom room, but I'm really pleased to have met you and I look forward to the continued weaving and, and connection and conversations. And I was just in Uganda earlier um, in August, so I, I feel like there's a weaving there also for us to specifically. I'm not even going to try and pronounce your name, Naluembe. <laughs> I try. <laughs> thank you no thank you so much no that was perfect and i'll email you thank you for everything it's been a blessing thank you. I, I would like to say that i feel so much beauty in this like what lakshmi said that it's like we, we i i'm always impressed about how can we just come together on this virtual space and it goes beyond the material thing so it feels like so much beauty and i'm like really really grateful for that and for all your paths <laughs> thank you for how you work <laughs> uh, okay so i i want to say something mostly it's really appreciate a lot i i'm from tibet and uh, with a lot of snow mountains and so here what i'm doing is that uh, Basically, I also feel and see and experience the the climate change, and then our planet is really like uh, we see that from the, the the snow mountains, the glaciers are melting like very badly year after year, and then so I'm trying kind of like bring uh, people together, and then to basically raise the awarenesses, and then to looking for the answers in the traditions and. Uh, as uh, uh, the, the answers from traditions and indigenous and also from like uh, uh, looking for the answers from people like you and then so I really feel like tonight I so for me I'm in the dark <laughs> so I see all of you are in light <laughs> so it is uh, about one o'clock here and <laughs> so I have I, I found a lot of answers and uh, a lot of inspirations, and I really appreciate a lot. And uh, thank you very much. I would just love to say thank you to Dan for holding the space so beautifully and inviting such wonderful people. Oh my goodness, that's all I wanna say. I wanna to touch into how like healing spaces and, and finding learning spaces that are healing, like this feels like that in a way, just like being able to look into these different corners of the spaces that we're coming from. And, and just like what's happening in my heart right now just feels so true and the aliveness. And, and yeah, there's like all these threads that could be um, picked up and, and stitched across these different places. And, and I hope people feel invited to do that. I certainly sense some of that is quite alive. Um, yeah, community, I think it's here. <laughs> I just want to thank everyone for coming and for engaging in conversation and especially to Joe and Marianne. Um, I just really appreciated the conversation and I hope we uh, remain in touch and, and I hope there are collaborations that are happening amongst different people who've come together here. And I think uh, I really am also very grateful to Ecoversities because um, this nurturing of weaving 
um, that the world so uh, needs. And, you know, and I see Sierra and Andrea and Dan, and I know how much time all of you put into this and all the effort it takes and the multiple emails and all of that, you know. So, yeah, just really thank you.